the health and safety of the team obviously is, is our number one priority and we've been working hard for oh, probably three months now on, on getting ourselves ready. We had a disaster recovery team that we have which hopefully we'd never use but as soon as this became a series that it did we met and we started putting together some of our plans. The first things we had to do of course is make sure we got the guys back from Melbourne safely and when they got back they went into isolation and then we started working on our plans of what do we do and when the shutdown was pulled forward that really got things into gear. So the first thing we had to do was make sure we could get people off site safely. So anybody that can work from home, we asked them to go home and that created even more problems for us because we'd never really had so many people. Um, the peak was, I think, 450 people working from home and the most we've ever had before that was, I think, about 70. So straight away, how do we get so many people off, which created challenges for us in our IT areas and other things like that, but we managed it. And then we went into shutdown mode. The team was renamed as the, as the Coronavirus Task Force. We met and we met twice a week. Really importantly was make sure we, we had communication, the whole factory effectively at home. And twice a week we sent out communication to let people know what was going on at a sort of government level, what was going on in the factory, what was happening with some of the projects. For example, Project Pit Lane was something we were working on. And just making sure people were kept up to date with all the developments as things were happening. When we knew the shutdown was coming to an end, we went into return to work mode. So this was when we started getting the factory ready. Taking the government guidelines as the bare minimum, we started looking at things like how do we maintain social distancing? So the whole factory in, in two weeks was completely changed to make sure that wherever we could, we had a two meter gap. So everywhere you go, you see signage, you see stickering, you see one way systems put in, into place. We also wanted to make sure that people were safe to come back. So we asked everybody to complete an induction at home with a series of questions and we prepared a video which showed how things have changed in the factory. And most importantly, if somebody was feeling poorly or not well, please don't come to work. So once people have been through that, when they come to work now, the first thing they do, they get their temperature checked. And we bought temperature scanners So at four different points in the factory. Every employee comes in and they get scanned. As long as their temperature's in a healthy range, they can come to work. Around the factory and every workstation, we have things like antiviral wipes that we expect people to sort of wipe their areas down before and after. If people are moving around the factory, we ask people to wear masks. When they're in the workstation, we've made sure that the two metre rule applies. So they don't need to wear a mask, but as soon as they get mobile, we ask people to wear masks. People we've got in the factory at the moment are the people who just can't work from home. These are generally the manufacturing guys. So the guys working on machines or the guys in build, they're in the factory and they're working. People like designers who can work remotely, at the moment they're still at home. And as time goes by, when we're comfortable that the factory can take the volume, we'll invite them back in in a controlled way. We've been talking a lot to our sister site, High Performance Powertrains, to make sure that we're doing the same things and some of the process they've put in place, we've done here and vice versa. So we're learning from each other and make sure we've standardised our approach. The fact that the shutdown happened very quickly, I mean, our shutdown is normally in August and we take months to prepare for that because we try to get lots of our preventative maintenance work done. This happened in, in literally a week, so we weren't really ready for it. But because it went on for nine weeks, we were able to actually do quite a lot of the maintenance that we could pull forward. This was in areas like for IT, for example, making sure all of our IT infrastructure has been checked and maintained, because we know we're going to be so busy when we come back. The way the race can is looking, we'll have lots of triple headers and very little breaks. So making sure that all of our key systems are robust and working is going to be crucial for us as we go forward. We've also done maintenance in areas like the dyno and some of the machine shops. Again, really for the main reason, we know we're going to be flat out for the next six months. Just making sure these systems are in the prime condition in readiness for that is really, really important. The way the race can is looking at the moment, it's just going to be probably as intense as we've ever had, with a number of triple headers, so three races in a row. These do present unique challenges for us, because if you have two races, you go to a race and you have some spare parts. If you have an issue in the first race, you can normally manage the second race because you've got your spares. Add a third race to that, all of a sudden you've run out of spares by the third race. So this presents a real headache for the factory and how do we make sure the guys at the circuit have enough parts. So what we're doing at the moment is we're checking our spare situation. Have we got enough spares around us? And there's a balance to be struck here. We can look to have lots of spares, but it's really expensive and we don't want to be wasteful. We need to be efficient. So it's a bit of a judgment call. What we'll also look to do is, well, what parts generally would get damaged or would get worn in the race? Let's make sure we've got them at a point in their manufacture where we can turn them around quickly. So we'll, we'll maybe half make them, three quarter make them, depending on what the parts are, and react when they come to. And our whole factory, is built around speed, it's all built around flexibility and, 
and making sure that we can react. The fortunate thing is we're used to doing this, so if we get an issue, we can generally turn things around in, in very quick time. Since we've been back from, from the shutdown, think things are different. There's the obvious visible things that you can see from the markings, from the signage, from people wearing masks, that, that's different. But obviously as well, there's, there's, only, there's half the company still working from home, which is a very different model for us to get used to. So it does present some unique challenges for us. What we're finding though is that the culture we have, the team working we have, is holding us in good stead with this. It enables us to be very effective and very strong. If you are working from home, there's a danger you feel quite isolated. Even though we have lots of teams meetings, so people involved in things, you're generally on your own. You haven't got the day-to-day -day contact that people have. We make sure we communicate as often as we can, not just on specific areas, what that person works in, but on the whole company, what's happening, so they're constantly informed and they still feel part of the team. But also as important, and maybe more importantly, we ask for people to give us feedback as well. So if they've got questions, if they've got any concerns, we have a number of different mechanisms in the company where any employee can get in touch with us to say, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening here, I'm concerned about this, and we make sure we respond really quickly to those questions. But the most important thing, of course, is to make sure our staff are safe as we get ready for the new race season.